Well, if you have your Bibles, if you would please open to Ephesians chapter number 5. All right, I've officially finished uh, the music for right now. And, of course, I had the handout last week. If you need a prayer bulletin, go ahead and raise your hand tonight. There is not notes in it tonight, but a prayer bulletin will get you going down the right path. And uh, Pastor Scott asked, he said, Well, Brother Howell, what are you going to split the church up over tonight? And so that's tremendous. And, uh, and so we're going to go to another, another controversial topic. And uh, maybe not as controversial as music, but uh, probably equally as damaging as a wrong type of music. Uh, maybe more insidious than that. And that is alcohol. Now, I'm not talking about rubbing alcohol unless you're consuming it. Sometimes people get to the point where they do that. I'm going to talk about alcohol, and not just alcohol, but alcohol and the Christian. Alcohol and the Christian. Does the Bible care about Christians? Yes. Does the Bible care what Christians do and don't do? Yeah, it absolutely does. All right, and we're going to look at now if the Bible talks about, speaks about, instructs about alcohol. Well, you obviously know the answer to that question. If I'm going to speak on it, then it probably does, right? Kind of like you kind of a leading questions like parents we do sometimes. Uh, what exactly were you doing? All right, leading questions. Ephesians chapter number five. A tremendous passage for a couple of reasons. One, it's a tremendous passage for husbands and wives. Now, you know that in, in uh, verses 22 and the following, it uh, gives some instructions to wives and to husbands. And, of course, husbands know verse 22, wives submit yourselves. You got that one down pat. And, and wives, you know later on it says husbands love your wives. We got those verses down pat. And, and, uh, but in this chapter... Uh, there's a couple instructions to us. I love the context of Ephesians chapter 5, which I've mentioned before, and I'll mention again, that Paul is presenting this concept to the Ephesians. He says, you are therefore, be therefore, followers of God as dear children. That's verse number 1. Verse number 2, walk in love. But verse number 8, he kind of turns, kind of, I believe, the point, the, the, the emphasis, of, uh, emphasis of the chapter, where he says in verse number 8, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of, what's the last word there? Light. He presents to us, I believe, in Ephesians chapter 5, kind of part of his point to all of his young Christians, but especially to the Ephesians, he says, you were in darkness, you were, you were as worldly, unsaved people who are blinded in the night, but now you've been shown the light of the world, his name is Jesus, the glorious gospel, and because of that, then you're supposed to walk as children of what? Of light. So help me here, if you go out tonight and it's dark outside like it is on my property, not too many lights out there, one by my garage, as I head back toward my pole barn, it gets pretty dark. And if I'm not careful, I can stumble on things. But thankfully, many of you have aided my addiction of flashlights. And for that, I'm grateful. One in my truck. I met one right here in my truck, and one right here in my truck, and one back there in my truck. By my door, I've got a drawer, and there's two in that drawer. There's some by the microwave. I know I grabbed that one by my, back, by my bedside. There's a light there, and there's lights in my closet, lights by the back door going back here. And that's not all of them. I've got plenty of lights. I've got enough to, to light the path. But I grab a light, and because of that light, I walk differently. Isn't that why you grab a light so you walk differently? You, you know, and what, what do you do with the light when you take it outside and it's dark? What do you do? You turn it on. Why? So you can see, and hopefully it influences your path. Paul is challenging the Ephesians and all of us as Christians. You, you are now the light in the Lord. You were in darkness, so walk as children of the light. He then goes on to describe, I believe, the rest of the chapter, what that walk looks like. He, of course, brings it to husband and wives, like we mentioned. But before he comes to husband and wives, if you would look at verse number 15. He's going to use a word that he used previously. He's going to say this, See then that ye, what's that word? Walk. All right, obviously he's tying this back into that concept, right? I mean, it's not an accident. He didn't forget how many words he used. And he, wasn't, he didn't get confused in what he's writing. All right? he, he doesn't have a, a, a dementia or anything. He knows what he's doing here. Okay, see then ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. 
So, so help me, does that mean that there is a way that if we were to live, to walk circumspectly, that means how you live and how you walk this life, is there a way to be a fool? Yes or no? Yeah. And is there a way to be wise? Well, it's simple. That's what it says, right? You Bible scholars, you got that. It says what it says, right? Well, I don't know if you're like me, but, but if I see that and there's a way in this, in this life to walk like a fool and then a way to walk wise, I want to know how to walk like a wise person. I don't want to walk like a fool. The Bible never says any good things about fools. Never. There's not, it's never like you know, a lot of good things about wise men, but nothing good about fools. So if I see that admonition, I say, hey, you know, I, I want to walk as a wise person. He goes on to, I believe, clarify verse number 15, where he says, verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. He starts off by saying, listen, don't be wasteful of the time that you have. Boy, we could preach a whole series of sermons on not being wasteful, right? And then apply it to uh, 2020 in America where we have uh, so many days off and the, and the time that we now spend, the, the lighter work week that we have. And, and of course, with all that extra time, we have more time to devote to the Lord, right? Or do we just devote more time to ourselves sometimes? Not everybody, right? All right, redeeming the time, he starts there, but that's not where we're going tonight, so I won't, I won't get off track there, so don't, don't get me off track. And 17, wherefore, be ye not, what is that? Unwise. Oh, boy, Paul's slipping now. First he repeats walk, and then he says fools and wise, and he says unwise. Well, he's either very confused, or he's trying to draw this net altogether. You see it? Be not unwise, but understanding what the will of of the Lord is. Now I'm setting this up. Don't look ahead in your Bible yet. Don't look ahead yet. He's going to tell us though what the will of the Lord is. If you ever want to know God's will, it says it right here. In the next, don't look at it in the next verse. He's going to tell us what God's will is. We've been studying that in Bible class. We're just finished in Bible class, right? Nathan and Alex in Bible class, good students in that class, doing a good job. Boy, sometimes we get confused, sometimes we pray, and we get really con uh, concerned. Lord, what's your will? And, and often it's very clear in Scripture. Lord, should I go soul winning? Don't have to pray. Read your Bible. Lord, should I love my wife? Well, read Ephesians 5, but once again, don't look ahead. All right. Here he says, though, here we are for, we're going to start tonight. Verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. We're going to start here tonight and give you a few things. Just on a very side note, in case you wondered where the next verse goes, you'll remember that we saw it in our music series repeatedly. Because the opposite of being drunk with wine is excess, but being filled with the Spirit equals speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always uh, for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Well, let's see if we can open in prayer and look tonight at some things about alcohol and the Christian. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for this time that we have. Lord, I pray that you would help our hearts and minds to be opened to your truth. Lord, I pray that uh, if there is some here or listening or maybe later on listening to this, Lord, and who may be uh, struggling or, Lord, even maybe not trained or know your truth about this uh, topic of alcohol, Lord, that you would convict through your word and you would reveal yourself to them. Lord, help me to say those things would be helpful or those things that would hinder uh, what would need to go on tonight, I pray you'd help me not to say. Lord, may we respond and may you accomplish all that you want to tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to begin this series on alcohol and the Christian. I will not get done tonight, all right? So don't worry. I know, and let me just address this real quick. At first, some of you are going to say, in verse 18, well, it says, look, it says, don't be drunk with wine, all right? So I thought you were talking about alcohol, you're talking about drunkenness, or two different things. We will get to that. Don't jump ahead on me. 
All right, let me lay, if I can, just some background of uh, some alcohol things, statistics, and then some truths tonight. And we'll kind of work through like I did in the last series. We'll kind of work through some problems, some background, and then I want to share from God's Word some principles. All right, we're going to talk about the words that, that denote alcohol and wine in the Old and the New Testament. They're different. All right, and, uh, and then the context of that. And then after that, we'll draw at the end some takeaways, and I'll give that last one a handout for you at the end, all right? Fair enough, that's the process we're going to go. Not all tonight, that's a process. Once again, um, we'll leave up on the screen, if you can, gentlemen, the number for questions. And I appreciate the questions throughout the music series. If you got some questions about alcohol along those lines, then please, uh, by all means, submit those things. If you have general church questions, just call the church office. And so it's not just an open hotline to say, hey, um, you know, why does the door to the left have a handle that turns one quarter turn to the right, okay? Um, you, you can submit that, but I will not be talking about those in this forum, just uh, about what we're speaking out about that. So if they can find that slide, that'd be tremendous, gentlemen. But this, this issue of, of alcohol and the Christian, uh, understand this, that it is apparently, as I am told, not a new problem. Not a new problem. Though it is a current problem, it's not a new problem. If you were to read your Bible, you will read about a man named Noah, who is not only known for the flood and for building an ark, but he's known for getting drunk. All right? And Noah is in heaven. All right? He's found in the chapter on faith. All right, so we would say he is a believer, and this is not a new problem. Throughout Christendom, I found different men along the way who, who they said either, either were in alcohol commercials and advertisements. All right, believe it or not, uh, uh, some men were in that who were in Christendom and, and, uh, or who dealt with that or, or struggled with it. Alcohol is not a small issue. I would submit that it is, not, though not a new problem, it's a big problem. It's a big deal. I believe that your view on it, an interpretation from the Bible, is a big deal. All right, just in case you wonder where I sit on it, I'm not okay with it. Just in case you wonder, all right? I go on record on my live stream, I'm happy to say it a hundred times over. You know, you can pause and rewind it. I'm not okay with alcohol and the Christian. Okay? I think the Bible is against it. Not just I'm not okay, the Bible is against it. And I'm, Lord willing, going to prove that to you so you walk away with the same conclusion after we look at the Scripture. Not all tonight, but kind of build some background there. You see, we live in a day and age that Christians now, and I would dare say even Baptists, are trying to bring this into an acceptable position inside of our churches. All right, I, have, I have some um, contemporaries, guys who would be my age. I would probably not call them close friends because uh, we differ on this particular topic, who think it's okay to socially drink alcohol. All right, and, and including uh, Baptist pastors. I, I'm not okay with this. I'm not. I am not okay with this. You see, this verse tells me that God desires Christians to be controlled by their God, not their desires. All right, God desires Christians to be controlled by their God, not their desires. And be not drunk with wine, wear it in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. With the concept and idea that the Holy Spirit's going to guide you. He's not going to speak of himself. He'll speak of what he's told and he'll speak of Jesus. It's what Jesus says to us in the book of John. And they'll say things like this. They'll say this. Well, the Bible only deals with drunkenness. If you get around a Christian who drinks, you will probably hear this particular argument, that the Bible only deals with drunkenness. Now, maybe before when you heard this, you were stopped. You were, you were caught stop dead in your tracks. I hope by the end of this series that at that point when you hear that particular argument, you will take a breath, right? Ask for God's grace and be able to carefully share God's Word and the truth from God's Word. We'll, we'll say this right now, just to lead into that, the Bible does deal with drunkenness, but that's not all that it deals with. 
So the Bible does deal with drunkenness. All right? That's clear in this verse and a multiplicity of other places. The Bible deals with drunkenness, but that's not all that it deals with. I had one Christian tell me this. All right? and, and, and know that a lot of these things that I'll bring are, are often from a personal experience. They were not lying to me. They were in a very stressful job. Stressful by any marker. We all would look at the job and say that is a stressful job. But I'm sorry. I didn't realize that if I have stress in my life, I get to do whatever I want to relax. Because if, if I do, I've got some grand ideas. <laughs> I've got some tremendous ways that are really help me just take the edge off my day. I tell you what, I was principal for 12 years here, and I love teenagers. They're tremendous. I love the young people. I love it. But some days, this principal job gets stressful. I can think of some great ways that I could have relaxed. One way, I probably would have jumped in my vehicle early and waited at 3.13 for the 3.15 bell, and then ripped through the parking lot as fast as I could to help me relax, perhaps, right? No, I'm just kidding, of course. There are lots of ways that if, if all I want to do is relax. And, and you know, the Bible uh, does talk about relaxing. It does. Jesus went apart to pray sometimes. The Lord created heaven and earth and then rested a day. Funny, though, as I read my Bible and was studying for this particular lesson, Pastor, I could never find to drink wine to relax. I, I didn't find it, so I must have missed it in my study. Or this one. I've also been told this one. You know, there are some really good health benefits. Really good health benefits. Now, hang on, not this week, but I will answer that. I have found some amazing statistics and information from secular websites, people who are not saved, who have no connection to the Bible, who answer that particular question. And I would tell you, but I'd just get ahead of myself, but it, it, when I found the one data, I almost jumped out of my chair. I was like, this, this is great. This is tremendous. But, but it's Christians. And they'll quote the verse that Paul said to Timothy, take a little wine for the stomach's sake. Say, so, ah, see? See, the Lord wants you to be healthy, and if you take some wine, then you'll be healthy. And then they sit there and stop as if they've now given the best reason known to man, and you can have no answer for that. All right, and we'll look at that as we go along. But, and, and, oh, they'll say this. <laughs> There's a pastor that said this to me. God has made everything, so everything is good. <laughs> okay. We now have a... a uh, theological conundrum, all right, a theological problem. We could drive a semi-truck through. All right, did God create the heavens and the earth? Help me here. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Uh, I, what I wanted to say was there's not enough time for me to spend to help educate your little mind, but I didn't say that, all right? But I, I read in my Bible a couple of things. One, that, that God is not the author of sin, all right? That God does not tempt anyone with evil, all right? And that while everything that God made is good, man in his sinfulness, in his wickedness, continues to seek to ways to corrupt himself. Beautiful marriage, man corrupted. Beautiful girl. Oh, well, we'll get there, though. One thing, and I will just deal with this tonight and not a lot, is just the, the, some of the effects of alcohol. I want to deal with this tonight because it's, it's not really a, a biblical argument, but I want to just share some, some things that alcohol, like, aside, set the Bible aside for a moment, all right? Though we don't set the Bible aside, I want us to, and just let's look at it in a, in a purely secular, social, and a results-oriented way, right? Because often, uh, uh, unsafe people look at things based upon results. Ask the question, well, what is the effect of alcohol? And according to the numbers that were found for me, an estimated 88,000 people die from alcohol-related causes annually. And the second is poor diet. I probably will not do a series on tobacco, just so you know. Um, 
though I did have a, a fellow Christian once ask me if I wanted to go, go smoke cigars with him. They knew I was here at the First Baptist Church. You don't have to know much about me to know that I don't smoke cigars. And um, this particular person had gone to college with me. They'd known me for a long time. And I looked at them with, that, with the best look of disdain that I could possibly muster and all the sarcasm in my face, all right, for such a stupid question. And I said, no. And they said, well, J.D., I can... Well, I showed so-and-so, and they really enjoy it. I said, I don't want to be shown the way. I don't want to smoke cigars. I don't want to drink scotch. I don't want to drink alcohol. There are 100,000 people who die every year as a result of drinking and driving. Hmm. Marriages are more likely to end in divorce if one of the parties is a heavy drinker. And that if one spouse drinks heavily, there's a 50% higher chance that the marriage will end in, in divorce. 13% of all employees, sick days are alcohol-related. And data shows that employees who have problems with alcohol produce at least 10% less work than their co-workers. The average household will spend over $500 a year just in alcohol. It's consumed by about, in America by, by about half of all married couples. A contributing factor in domestic violence. Verbal aggression is twice as likely to occur if alcohol has been consumed in the previous four hours. Physical aggression, three to four times more likely. And then just the problem of children and the custody problems, parenting time and health issues all related to alcohol. I got pulled over a week and a half ago. Confession time, right? To the corner of Morris and Curtis Road. It was morning, 7.45 or so, I leave the house. Rob, I mean, you're formerly on the road. Now, not on the road any longer, right? And uh, the officer decided that all I did was have a rolling stop. All right, rolling stop. What does that mean? You know, by, by definition, a rolling stop would be a stop. If it's rolling, if it says stop, it has to be a stop. Apparently, he thought I was doing more rolling than stopping. <laughs> Who knew? I mean, so what if the truck's on two wheels and you squeal around the corner, all right? Clearly, I had a view of both ways. Hey, he comes and, uh, you know, he said, hey, you know, slow down. Make sure you stop with the stop sign. Yeah, yes, sir. All right, glad to. Very kind. I'll be off with a warning. And, uh, of course, the kids are in the car and their eyes are this big. Like, oh, we're telling mom. <laughs> Shut up, you little brats. You want to stop by McDonald's, kids? What, do you want a Happy Meal, ice cream? <laughs> Anything you need. Anything you need. And, uh, you know, though, uh, had, a, had a water bottle there. But you know he didn't ask me? He didn't see my water bottle and say, Sir, have you been drinking? He didn't ask me that. But I was. I was drinking water. I used to have coffee in my truck, too. I've never been stopped for, for coffee drinking. Right? Sometimes I'll even have a Diet Coke can. It's silver about this big, kind of like a, a beer can, I guess, right? But he never asked me if I've been drinking Diet Coke. Why is that? Because we know, set aside the Bible for a moment, that alcohol changes people and jobs and marriages and relationships and personalities and speech and almost never for the better. I would challenge any of my pastor friends, and really anybody, to show me the marriages that have been put back together by alcohol. We were, we were divorced, we were a wreck, and because we drink, look at our lives now. Here, these were our kids, and boy, they were deadbeats, but now this one's a nuclear physicist, and this one is, a, uh, this is going to the Pentagon. Why? Because we drink as a family together. This is wonderful. And I used to not win NASCAR races, but the more I drink, boy, the better I drive, and now I win. I didn't win before, but now I do. And boy, I, I didn't uh, used to be uh, as good with my money as I am now, now, but thankfully, because I drink every day, I'm better with my money. 
Come on now. And I didn't used to be as good uh, as a doctor, uh, but boy, after I drink a lot, boy, I'm just an excellent surgeon. <laughs> what would you say if you walked to, to have heart surgery and the doctor's throwing back some? What would you do? Well, praise the Lord, he must be a Baptist pastor. <laughs> he must know God's Word well, and he must need to relax. Good thing. <laughs> I don't want them to relax before me. No, I want you to be tense, buddy. Well, why would we? Well, we understand that. And then I saw one of my friends who's part of this thing called hymns and hops. Hymns and hops. This is their tagline. Don't, but you can find it on Facebook. We keep it pretty simple. Come join us as we sing the good news and enjoy a good brew. Come on now. Come on. I mentioned this before, but uh, in Orlando, there's a new church called the Castle Church Brewing. It's a community church. Described itself, its self description, as Orlando's newest premier destination brewery. While beer is our passion, as a spiritual community, we exist for people first. Come on now. What's odd about that is I've read through my Bible a number of times now. I've read through the book of Acts, the early church, right? And we see the foundation for the church, Pentecost. People getting saved, speaking in tongues, getting baptized. Remember, selling things, Ananias and Sapphira, not so good right there, but man, house to house ministering, more people saved. You know, God knocks down some barriers. I mean, Peter, he's concerned about something. God comes in a vision and, you know, big, a big sheet full of animals. And I, I've never found the Jerusalem Community Brewing Church. Didn't find it in here. I've read Corinthians, they've had some bad problems. All right, they did. They had some immorality in the church, and Paul, man, just tore their faces off. And, and they, man, they, were, they, they couldn't get the Lord's Supper communion right. They, they were judging people uh, prematurely. They, they weren't quite right on the resurrection. He clarified the resurrection for them. And uh, he never said, and by the way, you could really help your church because you are spiritual babes, and I want to give you spiritual meat. What you need to do is next Sunday, bring the alcohol to church. He had plenty of time to do that. Throughout the 16 chapters of Corinthians, did he not? He talked about a lot of other things. He talked about speaking in tongues. He talked about love. He talked about uh, Christian liberty. And he never once said, told them, all right, when they're talking about baptism, communion, and, and these things, he never once, he never once said, listen, turn your church into a microbrewery. Don't find it in Ephesians or Galatians or Thessalonians. Don't find instructions to Timothy that way or Titus as sons in the faith. Plenty of opportunity, and the only place we have there, of course, is or the one place we have is where Paul says that to Timothy about drinking, taking a little wine for the stomach's sake. Though he does talk about conditions and requirements for pastors and deacons in there. It just boggles my mind. In 2016, a uh, 136.7 million Americans over the age of 12 reported using alcohol in the past month. 2016, 488,000 adolescents, almost half a million, aged 12 to 17, had an alcohol use disorder. In the same year, 3.7 million adults, 1825, had an alcohol use disorder disorder. And 10.9 million adults over the age of 26 had an alcohol use disorder. So in 2016, almost, almost 15 million people had what was classified as an alcohol use disorder, and 136 million people said they consumed alcohol in the past month. Apart from the Bible, this is a big deal. You may say, well, well, Pastor, you know what? I've been here. I'm never going to drink it. That's fine. You, you never should. But I want us to look at the Scriptures. We looked throughout the series, and I want us to know from God's Word why we don't do this. 
Because what will bring strength to your life is not just not saying, well, you know, you said it, I believe it, which, is, which may be a good place to start. I want my kids to start there to just kind of follow me. But I want them to know why we don't do and why we do do what we do. All right? I want us to know from God's Word. See, God desires, like I mentioned, that Christians to be controlled by their God, not their desires. God desires Christians to be prosperous when yielded to Him. In John chapter 15, if you flip over there, please. In John 15, where Jesus gives a very familiar passage to us about abiding in, in, in Christ. I am the vine, you the branches. And He says in verse number 5 of John chapter 15, that I am the vine, verse 5, you the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, he can do nothing. You see, God desires Christians to be prosperous when yielded to him. Well, what I was trying to share with the effects of alcohol is that alcohol, uh, 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 as far as everything that I found besides the companies makes you less prosperous and profitable. It doesn't that I can find do much of anything to aid, assist, or forward your life. And Christ says, as, a, as an instruction for Christians, I want you to be prosperous. But how you're going to be prosperous is you're going to attach yourself to me. So that if along the way we find out that the Bible teaches us that if we partake in some things, that they separate us from Jesus Christ, then they separate us from our prospering, and they hurt our walk with Him, and they hurt our fruit-bearingness for Him. Right? We can hurt the opportunity to bear fruit, and I believe alcohol does that. We'll look through that. The last thought tonight is this. That God desires for us to depend upon Him and not anything else. Isaiah 40, verse 31, is the verse that I chose for this particular point tonight. Though there are so many verses in the Scriptures, you may have a favorite. Often a life verse will be one that uh, speaks of trust and depending on God. Isaiah 40, 31, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. You see, in our life, nothing else can take the place of our trust in our God. Some and chariots, horses, but we, we trust in the Lord. And when we wait on Him, He'll renew our strength. He'll give us the ability to mount up with the wings as eagles. I've been reading my devotions in Isaiah and Jeremiah and the hard times, in fact, I've been preaching on Daniel on, on, on Sundays and Isaiah, Jeremiah, both link in to that passage with Daniel. When Nebuchadnezzar came, it was right inside of some of those, those prophets and the, uh, some of the fear that they felt. If anyone had an opportunity to, to have a chance for stress and to relax, it would have been uh, those Israelites being besieged by an enemy uh, country and enemy soldiers the superpower of the world at that point. Yet Isaiah says, but wait on God, nothing else. As we begin this series on alcohol, I would ask you with an open mind that you follow along God's Word, but you allow God to speak to you through His Word. Alcohol has been around a long time. We see it in Noah in the Bible, but they... They found pottery jars in China that date from 7,000 to 6,600 B.C., roughly eight to 9,000 years ago. A few thousand years after that, Sumerians in Mesopotamia found that they made beer with straws and mash and grain. But for them, alcohol was often used in sacrificial and religious settings as an offering to the gods. Well, isn't that interesting? Used in pagan worship. Interesting. Hmm. The Egyptians used it. It was a staple of their diet, but it was also considered, beer was considered a drink of the gods for the Egyptians. Well, that's interesting. Used in pagan worship. The Greeks used it. There's a statue of a 
Greek holding a cup of wine. Now, the Greeks used it in their, uh, as a medicine, but they also used it a pivotal role in their early religious culture and was often used as an offering, help me here, to the gods. Well, how'd you know that? Well, that's interesting. They would sometimes gather around in a symposium where there's a place for the elite men to drink together. The Romans adopted apparently from the Greeks. And uh, one of the Greek poets who wrote some talked about the god Bacchus who drank to excess. But then the Roman Senate outlawed some of the things. It was a it was somewhat of a threat to public safety. And then their perspective changed. China, China, Chinese people used it. 16th, 17th centuries, uh, Britain used it. They began to distill spirits. This would date back to 1525 to 1550. Around that time, Thomas Nash made, wrote a play and discussed the per- pervasiveness of drunkenness. For the first time in around 1600, the English mentioned drunkenness as a crime. Not as a good thing, not for an introduction to church, not for the pastor to get together. In 1600, during the reign of James I, they talked about the intoxication among all the classes. And that's when the English Parliament passed the act to repress the odious, odious and loathsome sin of drunkenness. Alcohol made its way to America. When the English first immigrated to America, they said they were unaccustomed to drinking water and believed it to be contaminated and unsafe. But they also rejected water because it was free, and they only consumed water when they couldn't afford anything else. Eventually, though, they, made, they, banned a lo- they had a law banning alcohol as payment. And then they began to consume in America rum, molasses that was distilled in New England. There was a whiskey tax, and then we had prohibition. It played a significant role in in the Civil War. But, oddly enough, because of the high rates of abuse, and because many soldiers, believe it or not, acted irresponsibly and dangerous when when under the influence, that they banned it because liquor was associated with violent war crimes. As I read through this history, I did not find anything that said, and this culture was advanced, that that people now became better. Over and over, if you were to study, as I have tried to study the history of alcohol and and the, the, the response to it, that is always a negative connotation. And where did I get some of this history? Alcohol.org. Dependency on alcohol. Dot org, dot com. I have some of the websites I looked at. Not Baptist blogs. And then, of course, I read you the abuse, its words, in modern times. See, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. The Scripture talks about it. it talks about being drunk, but that's not all it says. I want to, Lord willing, the following weeks, go through Scripture, kind of show what Scripture says. The places that it talks against it, sometimes it will just kind of mention in passing a concept. And there are a couple places that if that's all there were, we would say it's okay to drink. But that's not all there is. And I would submit that not only am I against it, but the Bible's against it. And I pray it will be so. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for the time tonight. Lord, I pray that as we go through this time and series on alcohol, Lord, that our hearts and minds would be open. Or maybe there's someone who needs their faith strengthened. Or there could be someone who is struggling and maybe not knowing why this is a big deal. Lord, may you show us from your word those things that are true and right. In Jesus' name, amen.